I think it's a bit premature. I mean, all I did was start a business, but hey, if they want to give me an MBE, then I'll take it. Because it made my dad come out and start was quite funny. Yeah, let's rewind a little bit and talk about your upbringing and that upbringing in Bradford and how you came to make that journey from Bradford to Enterprise in London. Um, I grew up in Bradford in a place called Thornton. I went to the second worst school in the entire um, catchment area of West Yorkshire, but somehow managed to do reasonably okay. <clears throat> and um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so became um, a, cons a consultant for Accenture. <laughs> <laughs> And, and my rationale for that whole thing was like, I'd, I'd been in politics in the US because I'd, I'd lived out there for five years while I did a, an MA and I'd started a PhD, but we won't go into that. And then when I came back, I thought, I can't go and work for an MP and earn like £17,000 because I'll just die. I've been a student for like eight years and I was 26 and I thought, oh, I need to earn a bit of brass. And then um, Accenture were offering £28,500 plus a nice. 10 grand golden handshake. And I was like, oh my God, and it's consulting, so it's like, Ooh, I can just go and do a little bit of everything. And I thought that sounded like a good idea. Um, and actually, that's not what I did. I became a specialist in electricity and gas for all my sins okay. and worked in all the glamorous places like Warrington, United Utilities. I worked in Exeter, Southwest Water, worked in Three Bridges at EDF. So just, oh God, where does Empower live? Like somewhere awful. Anyway, so I did, um, I did that for seven years. Um, and my co-founder Jules, who's also a girl, so Alex and Jules, both androgynous names, which is really, really fun when you're raising money and nobody knows who you are, and then these two chicks walk in and they're expecting two blokes. Um, and so she said to me, look, we'd been batting around business ideas for a long time, and I say business ideas because we just wanted to run our own company. We didn't know it was going to be a technology company, and at the time, she couldn't code, I couldn't code, but we just kept kicking around these business ideas. And anyway, the one that we kept coming back to was this idea of a eBay for local services. So we were like, why can you buy anything online, but yet you can't find, a, you know, a local childminder or a hairdresser or um, a cleaner or a gardener or a dog walker? And we knew this because Jules's dad was um, a driving instructor in Ireland, and he paid a fortune to get students through. Um, their equivalent of like the driving school. And we were like, these guys can't get to market. We can't find them. There's got to be a way to make them transparent. So anyway, long story short, um, she decided, well, she rang me up one day when I was driving home from Exeter on the uh, M4, and she said, um, are you sitting down? And I said, well, I'm driving. She said, oh, you, you might want to pull over. So um, if you've seen me talk before, I'm really sorry about this story, because I don't know if one or two of you saw me thinking digital, but anyway. <laughs> So she said pull over, so I pulled over and she said I've quit my job. And this, this time she was working at PwC, she was making more money than I was, so close to six figures. And I was like, am I allowed to swear? I was like, I was like you fucking joke for me. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah, but don't worry, because I bought a book and it's called Ruby on Rails Tutorial and I've spent, <laughs> I spent the last three weeks in my bedroom and I've built Twitter. <laughs> Oh my God. So anyway, that was the start of this journey. And then we, um, a lot of people know, we joined um, Springboard. We managed to somehow convince a bunch of angels that we had something about us. And we got into Springboard and we did 12 weeks on this accelerator. And we built this thing. We built a local services marketplace and it didn't work. Um, and I slept around London trying to raise money for a product that didn't work. But you decided to focus and drill down that, that local services into specifically into domestic cleaning. What was the what was the business model that allowed you to succeed with that where the broader one hadn't worked? So I think it's and it's what I see a lot of startup people or startup founders, they get this really big idea, right? Because you have to have a big idea if you're gonna go after a market. You know, you don't want to do just do something slightly better than the next person. So you come up with this big grand idea and ours was like we're gonna be eBay for local services. The problem is can't execute on that. It's incredibly difficult to market and serve 23 disparate, fragmented services where people want different things. And it took us a year to work that out. And so what we did actually is, um, I got quite depressed at this point and Accenture had rung me up and said, your job's still here, do you want to come back? And I was trying really hard not to go back because I felt quite like ashamed you know, I'd kind of taken this plunge into trying to be an entrepreneur and I tried to pass it off to everyone like, oh yeah, it's great, oh you're doing really 
well. And deep down, I was dying inside because it wasn't working and I knew it wasn't working. Uh, and I didn't want to have to go to Accenture with my tail between my legs, but I had a mortgage and I had no money. And so I got quite depressed and I was doing a lot of drinking at the time. I was probably putting away about a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc every night, um, which was making me feel worse because I was getting fat. Uh, you know, most people like lose weight when they get stressed. I don't, I put it on because I eat more. <coughs> Um, and one day I just had a total hissy fit in, in our borrowed office and was like, I can't do this anymore, I'm going back to Accenture, this is not working, you two are happy because you're just sitting there like, you, if you're a coder, is anyone, does anyone develop? A few people, right? So it's brilliant, isn't it? You write a line of code, you do a feature, you pat yourself on the back and you feel like progress. But for someone who's not a coder like me, who's trying to get people to the side, get them to book, like, that's... It just wasn't working, so I kind of shook them and we downloaded the data and we had a look at what the traffic was searching for, and it turned out to be cleaners. Also hair and beauty, but Tom, our other co-founder, was like, look, girls, I draw the line at hair and beauty. So we were just left with this one category, which was cleaning. So we took the website down over Christmas, this was 2012, and we rebuilt it over Christmas, New Year, Boxing Day, you name it. I was testing, they were coding, it was crazy. We launched it January 2nd, and that first month we got more bookings than we'd ever had on the entire site the previous year. And that was like, I can still remember the first booking, Claire Alexander in Greenwich. I'll never ever forget that. And I was just like, holy shit, people are paying me for a service. This is business. And it was just this euphoric feeling, and that was it, I was hooked. Yeah. Well, uh, and then over the course of the next 18 months to two years, that growth increased, increased rapidly and, and you got some more support as well. Yeah, so, we were, so I managed to finally close a round of like £250,000 from some amazing angels that I hold very dear. Some from this neck of the woods actually as well. And um, we spent that for like a year and we broke even. So our total business on a monthly basis was turning over £20,000. So we were burning 20, we were making 20, so we were just breaking even. Um, and then this remarkable thing happened where this American company that, was, that looked very similar to us, called Homejoy, um, they raised $40 million. And at first, I like went white, and I was like, well, that's it. Because they said, oh, we're coming to London. I was like, oh my god, Jules, we're dead. And Jules is very calm. You can tell I'm like the very emotional, like, roller coaster one. And she's just very, like, on the level, she's a coder. She's like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. And we did. <laughs> all of a sudden we started getting all of this inbound from venture capitalists in London. Um, and we went out on the January 6th of 2014 and eight weeks later we came almost six million dollars. Um, and that was the ha most hair-raising experience I ever had. So we raised the six million dollars, we expanded to Ireland, we went to France and then we finally bought a company in Germany because that was the best way of getting into Germany. Um, and we were growing 25% week on week in Germany. Um, that was two days after I had a baby. Um, so I left the office on Friday, I had a baby on Sunday, was back in the office buying a company on Monday. What was the driver there for, the, for that investor and that buyer? <laughs> what, what was it that really attracted them, do you think? So of all of the people that tried to crack the space, we were the ones that had done it with the most scalable economics, but also the technology stack and the pin in it was incredible. And I, I can say that because I didn't personally build it. Jules and Tom Billy and then our engineers that we hired afterwards. And it was a really slick piece of technology. Um, and it was kind of all-encompassing product. But not only that, but we were incredibly good with data. So we knew if we put X amount in, we'd get Y out the other side. Um, and we were just a very lean, a very, very tidy little technology business. Um, and that was incredibly attractive. And they pursued us for like seven months and they kept offering money. And I kept saying no, because I really loved and I, I still miss it, I loved running my company. Um, and eventually it just got a bit silly, the price got silly at 32 million and the government, um, there was a lot of regulation, so a lot of um, noise in the ecosystem because of Uber and the way that people don't like Uber and the kind of employee versus non-employee and the benefits and we were getting caught up in that conversation and I could see the writing on the wall that that was gonna become a big thing. Um, and also then Homejoy, the American rival that raised the 40 million, went to the wall, which kind of sucked the air out of the industry and made raising money, would make raising money more problematic. And so Jules and I had a very hard conversation one day um, and didn't speak to each other for like three days. Hmm. Um, and that's when we said that we'd sell. 
I mean, there's no way I would have raised $6 million if a home joint had raised $40 million. And there's no way I've got that amount of money for the business had it not been a hot space and there'd been lots of competition. So, you know, I would say that, you know, being an entrepreneur or being stupid enough to start your own business, you need a massive vision, a healthy dose of naivety, lots of hard work, and an incredible amount of luck. Because it's all about timing at the end of the day. You know, if I'd have done that five years previous, would it have taken off? And so you can have all those conversations. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I'm not sitting here, um, sort of, a lot of people say, you know, I've done this really good job, but you know, really, like, a lot of that is luck. I've done all right, and a lot of, a lot of luck on top of it. Uh, it was a momentous last year for you as well. You mentioned the birth of your child. What were people's expectations of you and your relationship with work uh, as a result of that event in your life? I think, so everyone always asks me what it's like to be a woman in tech because, you know, the numbers don't lie, like, we raise less money, we run less companies, we sit on less boards, and we hear horror stories. And I'm not, I'll, you know, I'll never say that I haven't had incidents, but overall, actually, I've not really found it very difficult being a woman in tech, actually, I've used it to my own advantage. I stand out because I'm a woman, um, and I manipulate the media a lot because I'm a woman. Um, and so, actually, I've benefited net-net. But I think that was the only time when I was pregnant that I actually really felt disappointed with people's reactions. Um, and I felt, I really felt disappointed with my own mother. Like, even my own mother was like, so then are you going to get another CEO and, you know, someone going to come in? And, and I was like, no, why, why would I? Oh, well, you know, it's a big job and you're pregnant now. I was like, yeah, we're not ill. Um, and so that kind of made me even more kind of determined that... Damn it, I was going to run this company, I was going to do a bloody good job doing it, and I was going to have a child that was well adjusted and happy. And I did, and I did both, and I'm tremendously proud of that. And I talk about it because I want to encourage more women to realise that childhood is not, you know, having a baby is not an illness, um, and you absolutely can have it all. Um, but you have to work hard, and that's the trade off. And you have to decide, you know, what you want. Yeah, well, well th that experience and that determination that I guess has put you in a position where you're widely regarded as, as a role model for, for other women and uh, young women coming through into technology careers. We had uh, Dame Stephanie Shirley here this morning, who is a, a, a role model from an earlier generation. How do you compare your experience to hers? I think I've had a much easier ride. I mean, she's got balls of steel, really, if you think about it. And, you know, she started the, the first... I mean, she, she did 50... Well, what, 50 years ago, what I'm still trying to do today, you know, starting a, a place where women could work if they had dependents, whether that's, you know, um, elderly parents to look after or, or women, uh, women, babies to look after. Um, and, you know, and that's primarily why I wanted to start my own business. And... I realise Bob's sitting in the front row, so I apologise in advance for this, but one of the lessons that I learned at Accenture is it was always on the top place of a place to work for women. It, Sunday times, best place to work for women all the time. And in, in the grand scheme of things, it is a good place, but what it's better at is it's a great place to go and get loads of maternity leave, and it's an incredibly hard place to come back to, as any, as any um, environment is. And so what I wanted to do was create a place where actually men and women would be the primary caregiver. So what we did at Hassel is we introduced two months paternity cover and six months maternity. And then this year we were moving to four and four. Because I actually believe that until men are allowed to play as, a, as an active role um, in the raising of children, then we won't, break, we won't get through the glass ceiling. Um, and I was really lucky with my husband. Well, I say I was really lucky. I made, him, I, made him go into, um, I made him go into RBS, invoice financing, where he got quite a senior role, and tell them that his wife was having a baby, and he was only going to be working four days a week because he needed to do 50-50 childcare. Uh, and I think if he was more terrified of RBS, he wouldn't have done that, but he was more terrified of me. Um, and so he did, and he managed to get a, an arrangement where he works, you know, uh, five days in four, and he has the, the one day off, and I did the four days, and so the baby only had to have be cared for three days, and we did 50-50, so I just think that you, um, it's really hard to um, go back to work when you've got children, it needs to be a joint effort, and we need to do more in business to make that possibility, and I think that's what 
dear Miss Stephanie was trying to do all those years ago, and it's a shame we haven't got further down the track with it. Sure, and I mean, one, one of the, the other things that just stood on uh, Dame Stephanie was, that, was her, her commitment to philanthropy, and one of the things that I've always been very impressed with about her was that she raised all this money, made all this money, and then yeah. partly through her own personal circumstances, gave so much of it away. Uh, what is that, uh, how important is that kind of what, what the Americans call paying it forward um, in terms of you know, the, the role of the entrepreneur committing to do something for good afterwards? So most of the entrepreneurs that I've met um, like especially in the tech scene, operate the pay it forward policy, and they, um, I think they also most importantly don't get into it for the money. Like I certainly never got into this business because I wanted to be rich. I got into it because I wanted to build something tangible, and I wanted to create a place where when people woke up in the morning, they didn't think it was work, and I managed to, to succeed in doing that. So the kind of sale was like this massive thing that I didn't expect, nor did I want really. So I was really lucky that there's an initiative, I don't know if any of you have really heard of it, but um, it's called Founders Pledge. And so you pledge 2% of your exit um, before you exit, and I did that. And I gave half of my exit to mental health and then the other half of, um, to um, sex trafficked enslaved women. Because they were two important causes um, for me. And um, so I actually, I think, I'm mean, in this incredible position where, you know, I don't need all of the money that I got in the exit. So actually, I'd like to try and give it to those people that are not as fortunate, but do, do so in a very transparent way. I think we've got a big problem in this country with charities that are not transparent, they're not data-driven. Um, you don't know what you're getting for your money. And so I actually support a movement called Effective Altruism, which is put, like, putting all of those lenses on top of those charities. So that if you put a pound in, you know what's gonna come out the other side. So I know that of my money, $687 is what it cost me to free an enslaved woman, and I think I managed to free about 25 or something. I don't know if they're free yet. Do you know what I mean? Like, it sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But, like, that's what it costs. <laughs> um, I think for me, we've got to do more than telling stories, um, and I don't like this idea of one organisation called Tech City that it is representative all over. I think. Ultimately, it sounds to me like London shouting with a megaphone to the north, and I'm not in favour of that. I see tremendous, tremendous opportunity in technology to rebalance the economy um, away from London, because historically, that's, you know, we needed to be there, that's where financial services was. Well, tech, you can do it anyway. It's so democratic. Um, and if you've been to London lately, I'm certainly not going to recite my next business there, because I can't afford the office space, and I can't afford the talent. Um, so, but in, in order to unlock the North, I think the biggest problem we have here is not the lack of talent, because we have tremendous talent, it's not the will, because there's an awful lot of will around, it's actually the, the money. Um, if teams and businesses always have to go to London to raise venture capital, then eventually they just move there. And I've seen it time and time and time again with Ignite. So actually what Tech North should be doing is creating um, avenues of funding in by setting up outside and reaching out to, to external shores and and wooing that money here and making Newcastle or Manchester the place that a venture capital comes to once or twice a month to do business. And when we start to see five or six of those types of players, that's when you really start the, the whole engine running because people raise, they stay, um, they exit or they move on and they feed into the next business and we start an angel ecosystem and it just, that's how it gets going. But that's what happened in London. And it wasn't like someone wrote a few blogs about Tech City and where, hey, we've got this massive ecosystem. It, it's actually so much more in depth than that and it starts with access to finance. What would the impact have been on your own business uh, had we not been in the EU? I think it's threefold. So, um, it's really about talent, it's about marketing, it's about finance. So, if, if we rewind back to where I was, would I have been able to do what I'd done with Hassel? And, and I think it's simple that the answer is no. One, because I need a big market. My business really only worked in capital cities, it didn't really work in the provinces. So I needed access to the 500 million consumers that live and operate within the EU. I think in terms of finance, I raised six million dollars from Excel, um, Excel Partners, which was the early back as a Facebook or a Silicon Valley uh, firm, one of the biggest. They chose to headquarter their venture operation and their fund for Europe in London. 
And they did that for a reason, because it's the most efficient and effective way of getting access to the talent that exists in Europe. If we're not in Europe, would they be in London? Probably not. We'll lose that bridge. We're the bridge in London between the US and European funding. And then thirdly, talent. And this for me is the most important thing, and people might not like my answer, but ultimately, right now, where we are in the short to medium term, we do not have the right levels of skills to staff the businesses that we're building. We just don't. And it's great that we've got coding on the curriculum, but it's more than that. It's about digital literacy. It's about, it's about data, it's about product management, it's about market analytics, it's about all of these things that when I talk to 16 to 18 year olds, they have no idea what that job is. So that's a problem. And it's going to take generations to resolve. So what are we going to do in the interim? We have to have people from outside our borders. And this is not a problem that's confined to the UK. It's the world over. We're in a global race for talent and we need access to the, most, the biggest amount we can. And if you take my engineering team, which was 10, I'm not going to rattle off where they were from, but they were from like uh, Poland, two from Greece, one from Italy, one from Canary Islands, three from the UK, one from Ireland, one from Israel. So ultimately, the top line was 75% of my entire engineering team came from outside of um, the UK and only one came from outside of the European Union, and that was a guy from Israel. And after six months of trying to get him the correct visa to operate on, we had to end it, eventually give up, because I just didn't have enough money and I wasn't big enough, and he went, he actually came back to Newcastle. So he's working now in Newcastle on the right visa, but for a big company that could afford to go through all that stuff. So they're my three answers, talent, market, and finance. And you know, I'm gonna be all right if we follow up the EU, because Jules is Irish, we'll incorporate over there, it's got low corporation tax, a massive, pool of talent in Twitter, Facebook and Google, and I've got access to the EU. I'll survive, but will everybody? Mm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. What, what one thing are you most proud of through all of that journey? My time with Accenture. Apart, <laughs> apart from your time with Accenture. Very loyal to Accenture. I think it's an incredible training ground, I have to say that. Uh, and Omar Abosh did not pay me to say that, I'm just kidding. Um, what am I most proud of? I, do you know what? I'm most proud of the company that I built. Like, there were 70 of us at the end across four countries. Um, and I, we managed to scale the culture. You know how people always say that you lose the culture if you scale? I actually think the culture was the thing that enabled us to scale. Um, and we really did have a band of merry men that kind of lived and died by the mission. Um, and yeah, and I, I felt like I really came into my own and understood what leadership, not management, but what leadership was about. And the fact that I managed to do that and have a, a baby at the same time, yeah, I, I, I fulfilled my ambition of demonstrating that I didn't have to choose one over the other. Cool. Yeah. I guess the flip side to that question is always, what's the thing you would have done differently? Oh, yeah. oh we made so many mistakes. <laughs> um, so I can't say publicly. Um, <laughs> we did. It's really boring, but we didn't do. Um, we didn't bring data in house. We didn't realise the importance of data early enough. That's probably the only one I can say. <laughs> say a lot of them are a bit litigious. <laughs> <laughs> market fit, what are, the, what are the kind of key drivers that will make you make that decision about which is going to be the one? I mean, ultimately, it'll be, it'll be depth of market and sort of barriers to entry competition, but the, the, the one thing um, that will decide it will be passion. If Jules and I just can't see ourselves, ourselves being able to maintain that level of energy and passion that it takes over the next seven to ten years to build the business, then we just won't do it. Because we were so we had 17 ideas and this was like going London, we thought, so we just put um, probs not, we had a bucket called probs not, and we just put like the ones that we were just like, nah, that's not going to work. So we, we got rid of like 10 or 11 of them, and we had this short list of like eight, and then we divided them up, and we were just going down this list of eight, and I was like, Jules, 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 can you really, really, honestly, get excited about accountancy 2.0? And she's like, no. I was like, right, props not. So we're down to six, and all six we think we can get excited about, so we'll go off and see which ones really stand out. Are you going to tell us a favourite? 
Oh, there's one about there's, there's an all, there's an autism idea that we've got um, that uh, it was so anyway, really I, I don't know anyone who's autistic so it's not like a personal experience but um, yeah I like things that are mission led I liked I really believe that you can do social good with a commercial business um, and so I think whatever we do will be very socially hopefully uh, so have a social good element to it but be commercially driven so it's something that have got to be very mission led. So there's an autism thing and, and there's an education and a care thing that we're excited about. Uh, we are out of time and uh, it's been, been fascinating, great to talk to you as ever Alex and uh, thank you very much indeed.